Atlantis. Was it a giant continent in the middle of the Atlantic? An alien civilization? The Aztecs? The Irish? Or just a figment of Plato's imagination? These are just a few of the many, many, many explanations for Atlantis. But what's the best? Or at least, what is the coolest? That's what we're going to do on this episode. Uh, we are each going to go and take our turn giving what we consider the coolest, if not necessarily most accurate, explanation for Plato's Atlantis. I'm Matt, and I am joined here by my brother Brian and my cousin slash honorary brother Drew. In addition to being their brother slash cousin, I'm also a novelist. And I'm Brian. I'm a graphic designer and illustrator. My name is Drew. I'm the uh, cousin, honorary brother, and I'm a physical therapist. We work together to create books about dinosaurs, the ancient world, and mysteries. We love this stuff. But we don't always agree. We are... Let's start with some background. Uh, the legend of Atlantis isn't exactly a legend. It's not the sort of thing that people would swap stories about back and forth. Instead, we can trace Atlantis back to exactly one person, Plato. Writing around the year 360 BC, uh, Plato tells the story of Atlantis in two of his works, Timaeus and Critias. In those works, he starts off with this elaborate story about how he first learned about the Atlantis legend. Uh, apparently, the famous Athenian lawmaker Solon went to Egypt where he heard about this from a family of like secret priests, then told it to someone who told it to someone who told it to Plato, something like that. But you all know the basics of the Atlantis story. Atlantis, among other things, was a vast continent, a supposedly the size of Asia Minor and Libya put together, and it sat beyond the Pillars of Hercules. The great harbor of Atlantis had merchant ships coming from all over the world, and the harbor featured a series of concentric rings with a canal where ships could go to the very center island. And at the center of the continent of Atlantis was a giant mountain. Atlantis had advanced technology that was a marvel of the ancient world. To take just one example, they had plumbing that featured hot and cold water for even common people. It was also a military power. It controlled its entire continent, as well as surrounding islands, and even some of the mainlands around the Mediterranean. At one point, the greedy Atlanteans turned their mighty navy on the Greek city of Athens. Fortunately for the Athenians, by virtue of their superior form of government, they were able to defeat the Atlanteans despite their inferior numbers. Eventually, of course, the entire island of Atlantis was destroyed, as Plato famously says, but afterwards there occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea. Now, most of the philosophers and scholars who came after Plato in the ancient world assumed that Plato invented this whole Atlantis story as a vehicle for getting across his points on philosophy and uh, the nature of proper government. Uh, for instance, that's what Aristotle thought. But this was not the only viewpoint. Some folks, like Crantor, thought that Atlantis was very much real. And Crantor was the student of somebody who was Plato's student, so you would think he has some credibility here. Crantor may have claimed either to have visited Egypt, seen the hieroglyphics, and talked to the priests who confirmed Plato's story, or at least met with travelers from Egypt who did the same thing. Now let's go to the early modern world. Around the time of the Renaissance, it was commonplace for scholars of the time to use the idea of Atlantis as a sort of a vehicle for an exploration of their idea of an ideal government. And some, such as Francis Bacon, suggested that the idea of Atlantis could maybe be found in the New World? What? And then, of course, we have the more fanciful, but more fun, interpretations that first arose in the 19th century. Perhaps the most famous of these is Ignatius Donnelly. In 1882, he published a book called Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. This was a very fun idea that put Atlantis as a giant island right in the middle of the Atlantic and claimed to trace the extent of the Atlantean Empire well into the New World and across much of the Old World as well. In more recent times, everyone from serious archaeologists to maybe more fringe types have suggested all sorts of candidates for Atlantis. 
And that's what brings us here today. Brian has a theory of Atlantis that, Brian, would you say this is fringe or would you say this is more serious? Is it fun? Is it real? What, what are we talking about? My theory, I would say, was fringe for a while, but it's gained a lot of popularity over the past few years. And I'd say it has a lot, a lot of credibility for being the real deal. Have either of you ever heard of the Rashat structure? I had not heard of it until you told me about it for this episode. Okay. Drew, have you ever heard of this? Unfortunately, I have not. Okay. Well, good. going to drop some, some crazy knowledge on you guys. So this is also called the Eye of the Sahara. From that name, I think you can assume that it's in the Sahara Desert, right? So more specifically, this is in the country of Mauritania. Contrary to what a lot of people think, Atlantis being under the water, that's where a lot of the more um, traditional views of Atlantis are. This one is that's obviously... Where, that's the... where Aquaman's Atlantis is. Aquaman's Atlantis is underwater. Yep, it is. But I would say he's wrong, okay? Because it's actually in the middle of the desert. So this is a very remote part of the world. As you can believe, the Sahara Desert is not the most easily traveled place. You're not able to just get around there. It's huge. It's bigger than the United States, right? So this is one little spot in Mauritania. And you can actually see this though from if you like go on Google Maps, Google Earth, you type in the Eye of the Sahara, it will take you right there and you'll see a picture of it. What is this thing? Besides it possibly being Atlantis, geologists don't really know what it is. There's speculation that it could be like an ancient volcano that created a dome and then collapsed. So they think it could be something along those lines. Initially, people thought it was like a crater from like a impact from a meteor or something. But the uh, volcano explanation is a little bit more mainstream now on what it is. But there's nothing else like this in the world that they've discovered. So this is kind of a unique geological phenomena. So that's why they don't really know what it is. Um, I would like to argue that maybe, yes, it could be natural. It could be man-made. could be kind of a combo of the two of them. We don't know. So a question before we go too much farther. Uh, as you know, Brian, I usually take the, the boring mainstream view of things. Yes. So is the boring mainstream view that this is a natural formation? Um, yes. I would say most people think it's a natural formation. Even the people who think this is Atlantis, a lot of them think it's a natural formation that the Atlanteans would have just built upon. Okay. But me being me, I think maybe it could have been <laughs> maybe a mixture of both. Little like some geological structures with the help of some human aid to kind of give it a little bit more of the shape that it has. So now I picture me running to my boring cor corner and you running to the fun <laughs> corner. Okay. So, exactly. So, yes. the, the lines yes, are yes. drawn. Yep. <laughs> Why do people think this is Atlantis? All right. So first of all, this fits the description of Atlantis nearly perfectly. So as we have all seen pictures of Atlantis, there's the two rings and then there's the inner circle island. All, all of them are surrounded by water, obviously. And if you look at this structure, it fits that perfectly. There, it's a big circle. There's two rings and then there's a center island. All right. All with like dips in there that um, look like they, they held water. The description of Atlantis has mountains to the north, which this has. Um, it also says it was surrounded by um, large rectangular plains, which this also has. There is evidence that um, this was once closer to the sea. Right now, I think it's about like 500 kilometers from the sea. So it's a bit of a ways from the sea right now, but there is evidence that the sea was once closer to this. I'll get into that a little bit more. There are also descriptions from Plato that describe Atlantis as being made of red and black and white stones. And that's Basically, what you find in the area are those colored stones. Um, other descriptions of Atlantis, it says it was flowing with both cold and hot water from natural springs. They have found evidence of in the center island of a natural freshwater spring. And there's also some geothermal hot spring in, in the area. So it could indicate that there was the natural flow of hot and cold water in the area that could have provided fresh water for the people of Atlantis. Also, you think that, hey, this region is a desert 
and it's been a desert for a long time. How could people live out in the middle like that? I was thinking oh, that, yes. All right. Well, let me give you a little answer to that. So most scientists now, given evidence that the Sahara Desert is actually densely forested, um, and as you know, I... As I say in most episodes, I'm a young Earth creationist, but I, they even would be on the young side as this, as early as 5,000 years ago, from their point of view, from the mainstream point of view, that the Sahara Desert was actually like densely forested and jungled. And there was actually rivers that running through it. One of them that they've found is the, I'm going to butcher this, but it's the Taman Reset River. They found that actually flows right through this area. So it would stand to reason that there was rivers running through and around the area of Atlantis. So what was the, it was initially a forested area? Yeah, and that's pretty much how all the, civilization... the Sahara Desert was, was forested fairly okay. recently. Yeah. So it wasn't like how it looks today? No, no. Okay, so that's how they were And I'll go into a... some of the reasons why I think it's more deserty now. Um, okay. So I can kind of answer that too. I was thinking when you're giving this description, how far away is it from the ocean? Because... Atlanta yeah. seems very connected with the water and with ships mm -hmm. and with the Navy in, in Plato. So how are they able to get all those boats out there? Yeah, so um, that was a good question. So right now, I think, I forget if it's 300 or 500 kilometers away from the sea right now. But as I said, there's evidence that the sea used to run up close to it. And there's also within the structure, there's an exit to the south that looks like it would have exited and flowed into the sea. Like similar to the description that there was, it flowed into the sea from the south. But also one problem that does come up is that it is pretty high in elevation. I think it's like 1,300 feet in elevation. So one of the explanations for that is tectonic plate movement has pushed it up over time. So it has just gained some elevation. But there is a lot of evidence. Um, one of the biggest things is if you, you can even see this from Google Maps and you look down, it, it looks like there's snow kind of all over the ground, but that's actually salt deposits from salt water. So that's in all the like the crevices of the the circles. And then also surrounding it too, like the plains around it. There's lots of salt from salt water around it, which indicates that there was seas in that area. To further build this point on why this is Atlantis. So as I mentioned, there are mountains to the north. And do you know what those mountains are called? The Atlas Mountains. The Atlas Mountains. And these mountains are named after the first king of Mauritania. You guessed it. King Atlas himself. And as we know from Greek mythology, Poseidon fathered King Atlas, who was the king of Atlantis. Also, side note, possible pre-flood Nephilim? Question mark. <laughs> Another future show preview. <laughs> exactly. The other interesting thing about this is when you think of Atlantis, you think of mass destruction from water, like a tsunami crushing it under the waves, right? Again, on Google Maps, when you are looking this, if you just zoom out a little bit, you'll see an entire runoff of water from a massive destructive event that literally goes right through the middle of the, the eye of the Sahara. And looks like it just completely leveled and destroyed everything in its path. And you can just see how there's ripples. It literally looks like you're looking like at the bottom of the ocean, how there's ripples in the sand. That's what the whole area looks like. And there's just runoff. I'm sure everybody has seen what like runoff looks like after a big storm. And there's like dirt and sand on the side of the road. It looks like that when you zoom out from space. Again, as a creationist, I would say that is evidence of the great flood of Noah being the judgment of God destroying this area. So I would argue that Atlantis could have been a pre-flood civilization that was completely wiped out by this massive event. Um, but even if you're not on that side, most, or not, I don't know if most, but a lot of science, mainstream scientists now are seeing evidence of large catastrophe flood events, including this one, which most scientists would agree that there was some kind of large destructive flood tsunami that wiped this area out because there's so many indications of it. Like I said, the runoff and also there's a huge runoff of sand from that area into the sea um, on the west side of Mauritania where it goes into the sea. 
And then another indication is Mauritania has historically been known for their large gold deposits. They've even boasted some of the richest people to ever have lived. So one of their um, earliest kings was is rumored to be the richest person to have ever lived. Like in today's money, he would be richer by far than anybody today, all because of their extreme gold deposits. Lastly, like I said, there is a Roman map maker, map maker, Roman map maker named Pomponius Mella. And he created a map of the habitable world. And it actually, when you look at it, contains this location of Africa. And it is called Atlantia, right in that location. You, you mentioned earlier that the... The boring common wisdom is that this formation is natural. What are the reasons to believe that at least part of it is man-made? Um, I would say because there is no other structures like this found in the world. They haven't found any other geological structures that I've been able to see records of in any of the studies I've done. Nobody else is. When I've looked into this, everybody's like, this is kind of a unique geological structure, which to me kind of indicates that there's at least some kind of human that there could be some kind of human interaction with the land that kind of help form it and sculpt it into what it looks like today it could have been in like the rough shape of what it is it maybe had some kind of help to make it look the way it does do they know what happened to the civilization so the prevailing theory is that it got completely just like leveled and destroyed in the um, flooding event so it would have oh, gotten, okay. like, like the city itself would have gotten still wiped out into the sea and the debris of it mm -hmm. most likely is scattered kind of throughout like that desert part of the sahara into the sea there are a few things that are in the area that do look like they could be man-made where there's like some rectangular and square structures in that area that look like they could be ancient structures but again it's a very difficult place to get to so there hasn't actually been much archaeological like digging or anything out there because again this isn't like the mainstream place to go look for atlantis either so i don't think they like getting funding to <laughs> yeah. go out there related question uh have they found any other evidence of human civilization in the area yeah i mean like i said there's been great civilizations throughout Mauritania for centuries. Um, like I said, there's like documentation of like the first king, King Atlas. There's been lots of civilizations just throughout the Sahara in general that they're discovering more and more. The deeper they're able to get into the Sahara, it's more than just Egypt. It's all throughout that region. And again, like there are some scholars who have a hunch that it could be similar to like the Amazon where things are kind of hiding in plain sight because it was so densely forested and jungled. It could have been like, you know, the Mayas and the Incas that were just all over the Amazon, but we didn't know it until we were able to get above and do the LIDAR, you know, but it's like very deep under the sand. So it's harder to see that even, but. Yeah. And that's yeah. the part of it that I, I do find really compelling. It's just the thought that if we assume, and I do think there is some decent evidence to back this up that in, prior centuries, prior millennia, that the Sahara was much more habitable, that there could be ancient civilizations there that are just hidden now underneath the sand. Yeah. Uh, so related to that, then, the folks who subscribe to your theory, are they saying that the ancient Mauritanians were the Atlanteans, or are they positing some sort of more ancient people that came before the Mauritanians? Um, I would say that they are saying that the ancient Mauritanians are the Atlanteans. Mostly be, I base that mostly on like them claiming King Atlas as the first mm -hmm. king of Mauritania and claiming them to be the king of Atlantis. The other big thing with Atlantis is it being a continent. In the mainstream world, Africa was divided into different sections by like large lakes and through the sea. So it was actually like this section was actually an island. What mainstream would say would be like. 10 million years ago what i would say would be possibly pre-flood this could have been an own island so maybe that would also give it credence to being like a continent all right so so they would they agree that this area used to be an island but it would have been far far further back in the yes. past than 
this would okay yeah and i'm making the argument maybe it could have been pre-flood so then that timeline would line up again but that's me speculating so <laughs> all right atlantis in the sahara has mm-hmm. a good ring to it <laughs> right that is interesting i'm glad you think so drew <laughs> <laughs> All right, now it is Drew's turn for his favorite Atlantis theory. Drew, what do you have for us? So I'm going to take you guys a little bit farther away, um, all the way to the New World. So you may ask, why am I so interested in and so adamant that the Atlantean civilization is Mayan, Egyptian, Mesoamerican in general? I know it may be hard to believe, but I'm actually uh, Mayan. (laughs) I'm not blood related what? to the melamas you're not yeah. it's crazy what other it's family crazy. secrets are you keeping from us? <laughs> exactly <laughs> so yeah i'm actually i think 96 percent mayan i did 23 and me so yeah that's why i'm uh, have a personal preference towards towards this theory uh, so so basically you <clears throat> really want to believe that you are atlantean yes <laughs> yes <Okay>. i do <laughs> i understand that <laughs> I like that because then we can claim Atlantean too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so my personal opinion of who the Atlanteans were is that it was one culture that actually spread out to other different cultures that we know of today, such as the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Olmecs, the Aztecs. What do they all have in common? They all built pyramids, <laughs> which is... One thing that French writer, historian, philosopher, and archaeologist, and also Catholic priest, um, Charles Etienne Brasseur de Bourbour. So this man, he was uh, born in 1814. He had a very interesting introduction into this whole archaeology and sociology of Mesoamerican people. Kind of came at the after all of the French exploration with Napoleon. And I think the Rosetta Stone was found in like the end of the 1700s. And that's when this Charles guy became infatuated with finding like the next big discovery. So Mr. Charles de Bourbour, he um, actually was the first one to translate the Popol Vuh, which is like the Quiche, for lack of a better word, Bible into French and then into the rest of the language languages that we know. And what's interesting is that he found that the Popol Vuh had also had a great flood in it, um, which is also described by uh, Plato, as we've talked about before with the destruction of Atlantis and the flood. But this man, he also inspired who Matt's mentioned before, Ignatius L. Donnelly, who wrote Atlantis, the Antediluvian world. He believed that Plato was also telling the truth. So I get this connection between all these folks who build big pyramids, right? The the Egyptians, mm-hmm. the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Olmecs. Was there some other connection that he found or was that sort of the, the core thing that pinned them together? From my understanding, that was the main thing that really brought all of those cultures together. It was mostly that back then it was the Europeans, you know, kind of thought that they were the greatest thing that was ever created. <laughs> and so they saw all these ancient civilizations that were more modern and more advanced. And so they came to the conclusion like, oh, it must have been some type of advanced race or aliens, Uh, which is also something that I was going to bring up is that some of these people also believe that it's it was aliens that were the ones that brought this culture and the ability to build these massive temples and give this good technology to these people and uh, let them flourish. So, Drew, I have, just to give a little bit more credibility to this, so I have heard that when Solon was talking with the Egyptians and getting the information about Egypt, that the Egyptians actually claimed to be a part of the Atlantean Empire. That's how they got oh, their start. Did they? That's that's what I heard. Interesting. So, just to give a little bit of credibility to this, the Egyptians well, thank you. themselves could have claimed... <laughs> they- <laughs> be a part and, uh, of their culture. <laughs> oh. So I have a clarifying question. So this theory then is that, among other folks, the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Olmecs, and the Aztecs all descended from some common people, right? Yes. Okay, so under that theory then, like, Mayans would be related to Egyptians. 
Yes. So I do find this genre of theory really interesting because of what it says culturally. Uh, you touched on this, Drew, that there was a time of European exploration of the world where Europeans were a little rattled when they figured out that other people had like society and civilization and technology. Like you hear a lot of this writing when people for when Westerners first discovered Japan, right? We, the Europeans expect like, well, we're the ones with culture. We'll, you know, show these poor people, you know, what to do. And they're like, oh, Japan actually has a lot of society. They have a lot of rules. They have technology. <laughs> it's a very similar thing with the new world in the great empires of the new world, you know, like the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incas, <laughs> Europeans come on over and they realize, oh, not only are we not the only ones with civilization, but these guys are better than us at a lot of stuff. You know, they have these advanced calendars. They have these really impressive buildings. They have civilization. That's jarring. And it really shook a lot of the European sense of self at that time. So it's really not surprising that a lot of folks would look over and be like, you know what? Atlantis. Or, you know what? Aliens. That explains how, <laughs> how other people could have all this cool stuff. So yeah. it's really, <laughs> when you look at the attitude at the time, it's really not surprising that these theories would come out. Yeah. And I did read some of that where just the fact that, you know, Europeans would come out with like, oh, it was most likely aliens or some <laughs> advanced civilization that gave this information and the blueprints for all the pyramids to these to these pe these other people that it was almost racist because mm -hmm. you know they're essentially saying like oh it couldn't have been these brown people that were able to <laughs> build all these <laughs> magnificent structures it had to have been either some advanced race from the from mars or like a very an ancient white race <laughs> white race oh, that, <laughs> I don't know, but so so yeah and here is where I start to formulate my own um, theory, because I'll be honest with you, viewers, this kind of stopped pretty much in its tracks somewhere around the 1800s with theories. But I know there's still some of us that believe, <laughs> I myself believe that it it wasn't, uh, you know, probably wasn't aliens. It wasn't a superior, singular white civilization. I think it, it came from people that looked like me mm -hmm. um and we we just were able to spread that information and uh <laughs> and, and it went to just varying different cultures throughout the world also you know i always kind of felt just very special <laughs> in my abilities when um, you saw disney's atlantis you yes. felt like this was about you I did. That's what you're saying. <laughs> and you know, it's, what's even funnier, I don't know if you guys watched it, but it was the Black Panther 2. Pretty much, like, that's the argument winner right there. Perfect. <laughs> like, if Disney says that the Mayans are Atlanteans, then I guess it has to be true. So <laughs> so I have, I have a question for you, Drew. I, I am curious. Is this <clears throat> something you believe in, like, your the rational, logical part of your brain? Or is it more like, I believe in my heart? That the blood of Atlantis flows through my veins. What, what, what are we talking about here? Yeah, um, it's it's more of a a feeling for sure. Um, <laughs> if you take the DNA of a Mayan or an Aztec person and put it against the DNA of an Egyptian person, it's going to look quite a bit different, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but, but you know, science science isn't everything. It, that's that's Drew. I keep thinking of things that. Give more credibility to this, though, okay? Brian oh, really okay. Brian okay. really, really <laughs> yeah. wants this to be true. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I feel like my theory and your theory can connect, right? I, th I think we could create a bridge at some so, point. Yeah, so you're the origin of your ancestors just lived in Mauritania, all right? We can agree okay. there, okay? But <laughs> I was listening to another podcast. Shout out to Haunted Cosmos, but they were doing one on giants in the Nephilim, oh. and they talked about the Philistines, and there's a theory. I haven't really looked into this too much. I just heard this, but <laughs> there's a theory that the Philistines, they actually started in the Mediterranean, and then they 
fled to South America and they started the Incan and the Mayan empires. And then uh, there was like a, a falling out of sorts and a fraction of the people left to go back to where they came from. And there's actually documentation in Egypt of these people that came from the sea and that they kind of wreaked havoc on the area. But then when the Egyptians finally defeated them, they sent them to the land that the Philistines settled and they called them the Philistines. The Egyptians did. So I, yeah, I could be part of the, mm -hmm. the bad guys. You're, from, you're related to Goliath, the... you know? Yeah. You could, yeah be. You, know? you could be. I mean, I am. I, yeah, that's yeah. where I get my height from, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will say Brian and Drew, a, a part of me wants to be the boring nerd. Who's like, well, what evidence do you have for this? But the other part of me is like, I mean, that theory is just too fun. I mean, come on. Let's just not, let's just not overthink it. Let's just run. I think with I've it. given an overwhelming amount of evidence. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stand with Brian too. All right. And now it is my turn. Um, compared to Brian's and Drew's theories, mine is going to seem boring in comparison. But I really do think mine is cool and interesting. Uh, but first of all, let me get ahead of what some people may say in response to basically everything that we're saying. Let's just confront right on the scholarly consensus, which is that Plato basically invented Atlantis to serve his philosophical argument. And there is a lot going for that theory. A lot of it is what I described earlier, that a lot of his contemporaries, including Aristotle, uh, just assume that's what he did. And also, this was a pretty common practice of the time. Uh, remember I mentioned that Plato claimed to have gotten this story kind of second, third hand from uh, the famous lawgiver Solon, who in turn got it from Egypt. Now, that is actually a pretty common convention for the time. Basically, if you were Greek or if you were Roman and you wanted your story to sound ancient and cool, you attributed it to the Egyptians. And that sort of gave your story a lot of cool credibility. This, it, this could very well be what Plato is doing there. But there is between, you know, saying that X places Atlantis, you know, one to one ratio and the other extreme of saying Plato totally made it up. There's a sort of in between area. And that's what I want to focus on. And that's that Plato may be drawing on some sort of vague cultural memory of an earlier civilization. So I'm not saying that this civilization was Atlantis, but I am saying that through the centuries, through the millennia being passed down, passed down, passed down, there is some sort of echo there. There's some kernel of a source that Plato may have been relying upon. And that is why I am pointing to the Minoan civilization. I love the Minoan civilization, and Brian knows this firsthand. Uh, me and Brian, I've mentioned this before, we're working together on a book project. It's called Red Rex, going to be published November of 2024 with Bandersnatch Books. Look out for it. But Part of it is I want a lot of ancient illustrations. And whenever Brian gives me an illustration, I almost always give him the note, more Minoan. I confirm. But the Minoans are a fascinating group. Their civilization flourished on the island of modern-day Crete uh, starting around 5,000 years ago. In some ways, they were the first European civilization. And I say in some ways because it's not clear that we should really think of them as European. Uh, culturally, they had a lot more in common with Near Eastern peoples like Iran. But we do know that the Minoans were really gifted sailors. They had a maritime and merchant empire going all throughout the Mediterranean. And we found Minoan artifacts all throughout the Mediterranean ports. Uh, it's also important to know that we call them Minoan, but that's really mostly made up on our part. We call the Minoan because of the famous mythological king Minos, who lived on the island of Cree, and he's famous for, among other things, the Minotaur. So we have the Minoans. They have this flourishing maritime trade empire, possibly a military empire around this time. Now let's go to the Minoan harbor. There's a couple ways to look at this. Uh, the main Minoan civilization was on the island of Crete. But they did have another harbor on the modern-day island of Santorini. I want you to really take a good look at the island of Santorini. It's an island uh, pretty close to the island of Crete, obviously in the Mediterranean. I want you to go back to the way that Plato described the port for Atlantis. He talked about rings of concentric circles dividing land, sea, land, sea, until we get to a central place. You, looking at a satellite image of Santorini today, you can see how that could be. And for reasons that I will get to in a bit, 
Santorini originally had further layers of rock that would have been dividing up the, the rings of ocean that later crumbled away. So we can see how very easily the island of Santorini could get developed into this concept of a port, just like Plato mentioned. Also, Plato mentions that the island of Atlantis has a mountain at the center, which is about 50 stadia from the center. Now, we need to be careful using, using ancient measurements like the stadia. But if we use what we sort of think it was, we can imply from that that the whole island was about 11 miles square. Interestingly, the modern-day island of Santorini is about 10 miles square. So we're already looking at an area that's about the same size if you measure things correctly. Also, the Minoan civilization had a lot of really impressive building works. Uh, some of the palaces uh, decorated with a lot of intricate frescoes. They were really master builders. And the natural rocks in the area lent themselves to building in rocks that were white, red, and black. Those happen to be a lot of the colors that were mentioned by Plato. Plato also mentions the advanced technology of Atlantis. Uh, one of the aspects of this was the ability to have hot and cold water uh, running freely, sort of indoor plumbing that was available even to common people. Well, the archaeological sites in the Minoan civilizations indicate they had this very thing. There's also the fact that the bull seemed to play a very important part in both Atlantis and the Minoans. Uh, Plato mentions that the bull plays a prominent ritual role uh, for Atlantis, whereas the artwork and some of the uh, things that we have preserved from the Minoan civilization indicate that bulls played a very prominent role in their probably religious rituals. Let's sort of take a pause here at what we have right now. We have an advanced civilization that had a huge maritime empire stretching throughout the Mediterranean. It also had lots of uh, specific modern conveniences that were mentioned by Plato and had a harbor that probably looked a lot like the one that Plato described in Atlantis. And if you calculate everything correctly, may have been approximately the size laid out by Plato. Do you have any questions right now or have I just won the, won the argument? You haven't won yet, but I don't have any questions as of right now. <laughs> okay, how about you, Drew? <laughs> so you said that the Minoans also had the ability to turn hot and cold water on? Yeah, they, they basically had a system of indoor plumbing. And when you combine that with, I believe, natural springs, they're able to get hot and cold water in, inside. But was it like at will? Like the like if you wanted hot water, you could have hot water? <laughs> or And then if you wanted cold water, you could have cold water? Or they just had access to... I do yeah. not know that okay. part. I would have to take more more in. But for, <laughs> suffice to say, for our purposes, they had very advanced plumbing. Okay. So how far back did you say the Minoans go? Like, how far back does this predate Plato? So they were already going by about, um, I want to say 4,000 BC. The civilization endured until about 1400 BC. So Plato's writing about 300 BC. The Minoan civilization, as we would know it from the archaeological record, had been gone for about a thousand years by the time Plato was writing. Thank you. <laughs> so let me pause now and address what I think is a very fair criticism of a lot of these Atlantis theories. And that's that if you pick and choose what aspects of Plato's account you go through, you can make a whole lot of civilizations plausible Atlantis candidates. I know the first time I saw the Santorini theory, I was totally convinced. I was like, all right, there we go. Minoans equals Atlantis. There we go. But then I saw another episode of like some Discovery Channel episode uh, talking about this city in like modern day Greece and another one in Spain. And I also found them about equally convincing. And I was like, oh, they can't all be Atlantis. So maybe it's just actually pretty easy to build a case if that's what we're doing. As compelling as I do find that, I do think Santorini has an ace up its sleeve that a lot of these other civilizations does not. And that is the volcanic eruption. The island of Santorini is very, very close to an active volcano. We know from other evidence that this volcano has erupted periodically every, you know, lots of thousands of years. And we also know from various sources of evidence that this volcano erupted sometime around 1600 to 1500 BC. This eruption would have been absolutely cataclysmic. By some estimates, this might have been the largest eruption in all of known human history. 
And there's even some evidence suggesting that this eruption was visible from China. This is a massive, massive event. This would have completely obliterated any civilization on the island of Santorini. It would have caused a lot of the harbor to collapse into the ocean. Now, we think that the mainland of Crete would have mostly escaped the effects of this eruption. However, this eruption also likely would have caused catastrophic tsunamis. So the ocean literally coming in to destroy a lot of the civilization on Crete. And there's evidence that we found in the archaeological record suggesting that that is what happened. That at some point around this time frame, that Crete was hit by a tsunami. And after this happened, as you can imagine, this crippled the Minoan civilization. The survivors of it, you know, mostly on Crete, would have had a, a lot of their farmland destroyed, a lot of their buildings destroyed, and that would have made them a lot more vulnerable to outside forces like the Greeks. Let's go back to the account of Plato, that the Atlanteans were very warlike and they went to battle with the Greeks, but eventually the Greeks prevailed. And that's what we see happening as of about 1450 onward. The Greeks seem to conquer this weakened Minoan civilization. And from after that, Crete essentially becomes Greek. Also, one very obvious criticism of this theory is that the geography doesn't match up. Remember earlier that Plato described Atlantis as being beyond the Pillars of Hercules. Now, historically, people have understood the Pillars of Hercules to mean the Strait of Gibraltar which would mean that Atlantis has to be beyond the Mediterranean Sea, probably somewhere in the Atlantic. However, there's been more recent suggestions that the Pillars of Hercules could actually be formations uh, jutting out from the mainland of Greece. In that case, the Minoan civilization on Crete could actually work quite well. And but was just, their king's name Atlas? Their king was <laughs> named Minos. So, I don't know. <laughs> and... Let me also say, uh, again, I just want to be clear because I need to be the responsible nerd here. I do not believe that Minoan civilization equals Atlantis by a one-to-one -one comparison. My argument is a lot fuzzier than that. I think that if a powerful civilization like the Minoan civilization was wiped out due to this catastrophe, this volcano eruption followed by a tsunami, that's going to live in the corporate memory of a lot of the folks in the Mediterranean region. Folks like in Egypt, like in Greece. And even if there aren't a lot of specific records about it, it's going to live on in the memory, in the folk traditions, in the legends that get passed on. Maybe some of these legends, along with some of the specifics of the Minoan civilization, you know, embellished over time, got passed down to Plato, and he sort of drew upon this vague tradition and added a lot of rhetorical and fictional flourishes for his Atlantis. That's, that's what I think is plausible. You can never prove or disprove it, which is one of the reasons it's such a fun theory, and I like it. But I think that argument is completely plausible. And me personally, because I just like the Minoans and I think they're cool, I like to believe that they're the inspiration for Atlantis. So you're saying that they are the inspiration for the story. Essentially, not that they are Atlantis. Yes, I am saying that the Mino that a folk memory of okay. the Minoan civilization and their destruction was sort of the the kernel that uh, Plato used for inventing Atlantis. Cool. One question with this: in your mind, where, like, why wouldn't the name Minoans have been passed down? Why is it called Atlantis? Well, the name Atlantis does come from Atlas, like you said, Brian. So I, I believe Plato mentions this, where he believes that Atlas, in sort of the mythological past that he paints, that Atlas has a special rulership role over Atlantis. That is a part of it that we don't exactly know what the Minoans called themselves, and we don't know what other people called the Minoans exactly. We, we have some ideas what, about what the Egyptians may have called them. We don't know what the Minoans called themselves. So I don't know where Plato would have associated Atlas with it. Um, I can't say that. And there you have it. Three of our favorite suggestions for what Atlantis may have been, what may have inspired Plato. If you have maybe your own favorite candidate, either one that you actually think is plausible or one that you just think is fun, uh, please let us know in the comments. Or if any of us missed anything, if you think one of us left a good argument for our side on the table, 
or if we got something wrong, uh, let us know in the comments as well. If you want to watch a similar video that we've done, one about uh, arguing over ancient civilizations and cool giant superstructures, why not check out our video on the supposed Bosnian Super Pyramid? Also, carrying over the tradition from our last video about Nessie, let's make this another competition. You guys can tell us in the comments whose theory you think is best, and maybe we can tally up the points. And as always, don't forget to boop that like button <laughs> and subscribe.